Our talk is entitled Mind, Mortal and Immortal. And as you know, when we speak about mind in the Western Mystery Training System, we're referring to, to more than one phase of the expression of consciousness. If you will look upon the Kabbalistic tree of life, you will see that each of the ten circles in actuality, at least you may not see it yet, but I hope you'll see it, each of these ten sephiris, as they are called, these emanations of the Most High, these activities of the power or consciousness of deity, actually express a specialization of what we may call the absolute mind. The absolute mind being something none of us can at all comprehend with what we call the intellect because intellect in itself automatically by the very terms of what it is excludes the possibility of understanding absolute. In other words, we cannot understand the word absolute nor we can nor can we have any real concept of this meaning with our intellects now this is something from the uh, aspirants first hear it that disturbs them because so many human beings identify themselves with their intellects and therefore ident when we identify ourselves with our intellects the idea that we are unable to comprehend the divine or the higher with the intellect becomes something disturbing indeed. However, if I point out to you that on the Kabbalistic tree of life, the area that is assigned to the workings of the intellect, the activities of the intellect, is the orange sephira, which is called splendor. And if I remind you that everything below the yellow sephira, beauty, is assigned to the personality powers or to the personality expressions. And then if I remind you further that our personalities are something we have or we own, I mean, we are not our personalities, as you, I'm sure you realize, and we'll try to realize it more fully, we will try to see what is the difference between mind from one level to the other, and where are they correlated so that we can better understand what is meant in Kabbalah by mind, mortal, and immortal. Now, that blue sephira that you see, called mercy, is actually a sign to what we call the higher mind. In astrology, the higher mind is called the ninth house and it is assigned to such functions as philosophy, uh, religion, and philosophy and religion in terms of what we inherit, incidentally, from the past, as well as what we have in the present. So that abstract thinking is certainly more in alignment with philosophical ideas, and concrete thinking would therefore be assigned to things that are not basically philosophical in structure. So again, astrologically, the what is called the lower mind is assigned to the third house of Gemini, and Gemini, incidentally, is discrimination, and that is key uh, in tarot series, it's assigned to key six, the lovers. And remember, discrimination has to do with being able to tell the difference between this and that. That's why we have Adam and Eve, who eating of the apple, who suddenly knew the difference between this and that, uh, which uh, some people uh, still sorrow over, and other people have learned to rejoice that, after all, uh, perhaps it's worth the pain to know the difference between this and that, which means the pair of opposites, good and evil without the ability to know the difference between this and that we wouldn't know the difference between the night sky or a day sky for example we'd have no way of experiencing it whatsoever uh, if without the awareness of the this and the that or the pair of opposites which then of necessity has to include things like um, 
all knowledge, which would be the absolute mind, and ignorance, which is its opposite. In other words, for the sake of manifestation, the one life, the absolute mind, the all consciousness, has to take on the appearance of ignorance in order for there to be the experience of variation or this and that, of light and dark, of night sky and day sky, of good and evil then. So that those who sit down and analyze consciousness at all are able to analyze it only because they have reached that point in their evolution, and that means they are human beings. They have reached that point in their evolution where having eaten of the fruit of the, the tree, and remember this is the tree of life, having eaten of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, have actually evolved to the point where they have the kind of consciousness that can differentiate, that can start learning how to use that extraordinary aspect of human consciousness which we call the intellect, splendor, the, on the tree of life shown the, uh, by the orange, the sephira. So the ability and capacity to experience all of the infinite and extraordinary and mysterious and magical variations which we certainly experience although some of us don't think of it as being uh, very magical or wonderful, unfortunately, not yet, but let's try together to experience it as much as we can, at least this morning. Maybe we can take it out with us. And in moments that appear dark, suddenly the splendor of the intellect may suddenly burst upon us and we'll start recognizing the ma miracle and magic of the ability and capacity to know variation, that is, the miracle of having been able to go through all of those phases of evolution that uh, must include going through a phase of ignorance or many phases of many ignorances might be more to the point, in order to arrive at the magical ability, capacity to experience manyness. Now, what is the mortal mind of us? Let's analyze this a little bit more with the, about the intellect. What was your intellect like when you were 12 years old? And tell me about your intellect, if you've reached it yet, those of you who reached 16. Think a moment. What is this intellect? This intellect is uh, an instrument. Instruments are there for a purpose. And we have, we're supposed to utilize it for the purpose that the divine uh, has uh, grown it for. But the intellect, remember, is very dependent on its uh, expression. It's very dependent on all of the other phases of the activity of personality. There's no such thing as an intell as intellect by itself. Try to express the intellect if you cut out the brain, God forbid. Where's the intellect? I mean, as long as the Lord of the universe is manifesting via the body, where is the intellect if you cut out the brain? So you see, the intellect is dependent on something that we call a brain, whatever that is. Uh, and on the other hand, we think of uh, aspects of our mind as being uh, tied up with uh, other portions of our being. But what we seem to forget is that an instrument, despite its very obvious specific function, is never the person, for example, who has built the instrument. Never. Nor is it ever the product. In other words, the instrument isn't the product. You use an instrument to build a product, like manufacture something. So the instrument is used as something with which to accomplish something. And it is therefore being, it is an instrument. But we, in delusion, because remember, manifestation requires a limitation, 
we have associated ourselves, we have identified ourselves with that instrument, which is an instrument of limitation for special purposes. But by identifying ourselves with this instrument of limitation, we keep ourselves in that area of ignorance where there isn't the slightest chance that we're going to experience who and what we are, not while we're in that. Only when, what you, if you choose to call it karma, choose it that, growth, evolution, only when we finally have come to a point where the intellect, due to the impact it has had continuously with its own ignorance and uh, had repercussions from its own ignorance, only when the, in when the intellect finally comes to this point where it is you might say just about knocked out, curious as this may seem, only then do we reach a point where we're able to have some kind of flash of what the intellect is all about. And splendor, which is assigned to the function of the, of the intellect, is at the receiving end of what? Of the divine soul, because divine soul is assigned to understanding the cosmic mother and the cosmic mother, remember, is called the forever pure and undefiled, as well as the cosmic womb, the sphere of the activity of Saturn, which means it is the principle of limitation. And so as the principle of limitation, we have uh, the, manifest, the manifestation of limitation via the intellect. The intellect is an instrument to hold something in a, a limitation. Now, if you don't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, think for a moment. When you concentrate on a book, now it's your intellect that is the instrument that's holding your mind stuff together to concentrate it on the book. When you are watching TV, now you may be watching junk. Nevertheless. <laughs> Most of the time, what else is there? <laughs> Nevertheless, it is the intellect that is the focusing, the attention. The minute you focus your attention, you are limiting. You are taking the absolute or that portion of the absolute mind, which is has been put within the framework of your beingness, and you are limiting it into an area for what purpose? To either grow, to evolve, or to gather in junk. I mean, uh, the intellect, uh, when we're not using it for, to discriminate, can take in junk just as marvelously and perfectly and splendorously <laughs> as it can anything else. It's a fa fabulous uh, instrument. And it is, uh, therefore, it isn't, uh, it, it isn't the intellect that is the real director. The real director, what we're going to do with the intellect, is the self. So again, we can think of the intellect as being like a possession of the self. It's an instrument that we use, but certainly we cannot think of the intellect as being something immortal. Otherwise, you should still have the intellect that you had at age 3 and at age 12, but you sure don't. We can start seeing that the intellect is the instrument that the God uses for limitation, but then we have to understand what is limitation. Now, when limitation is something we are not using consciously and deliberately, it, of course, becomes an instrument for evil, as witness those that get caught up in the mob kind of spirit. But then, when we reach that point in our own evolution where our intellect has become sharp and you know it becomes sharp due to the fact that it gets itself into more tr more trouble that's why you see the path of the devil pours into it from the central ego you notice that the boy is the in so the intellect is devilish as a matter of fact what else can it be when it's the instrument of to uh, uh, give us the ability to be separative but at the same time the ego beauty is what Kabbalah calls the separating influence. So it is the true ego seated in the hearts of men that is the image-making power of man 
that is really the separating influence and it is that way in the same way that it decides gee if I'm glorious as a sun reflected in one mirror gee look how much more dazzling I am if I reflect myself in a thousand mirrors and what is and what is it that mortal mind is the illusion and the delusion that it alone is reflecting the light the limitless light that is before even the I am that I am which mind cannot remotely comprehend but superconscious mind which every one of us has in some latent sense or other since we haven't evolved the ability to fully function in it superconscious mind however uh, that we can experience once we come to the realization that we are not the intellect and that we're going to have to go to work and consciously use this intellect to help us attain the higher states of mind. Well, you see, you can see that mercy, the blue sephira, and, and splendor, the orange sephira, are on a line. They, it goes through beauty, the sun, the ego, but notice it's a reflection. The higher mind reflects itself into splendor. And splendor, the intellect being an instrument, is just using a portion of it. We, with our intellect, our personalities, our specialized in instruments, but there's only the one power. There's only the one consciousness, the absolute consciousness, which is God, that actually is the power that is the ex uh, or develops these specialized expressions I said from my point of view in order to be dazzled himself with all the beauties you know lots of people have the idea that aspiration has to be a, a grim thing well it's grim as long as we're in a state of separation and and, uh, and are subject to the devil blessed blessed devil there because without the devil how would we ever start really working and yearning towards the angel the devil forces us to <laughs> the limitation and ignorance they have the idea aspiration has to be a grim thing the truth of the matter is it has to be grim only as long as we're still in the state of consciousness where we, we make it grim and keep it grim the truth of the matter is if every reflection whatever it is is that one sun that dazzling splendor which expressing in this specialized way express, expresses in the differentiated kind of mind which may be mortal mind but it is still the divine my mortal mind may change and uh, let's hope to God it does if my intellect becomes frozen God help all of uh, all, all of us that are sitting here and if your intellect becomes frozen God help you God will thank God for that <laughs> because nothing else does eventually but the point is the, the intellect in itself is a changing, growing thing as an instrument. But that which has been, which has grown this instrument, that which uses it, is something so vastly beyond that surely the limited expression, once it has reached the recognition that it is radiating and mirroring that blindingly glorious sun, it can afford to sparkle with the laughter and indeed could that not be perhaps one of the most specific and sole purposes for the development and manifestation of these specializations so that there can be the laughing chuckling interacting joy and so in this laughing chuckling interacting joy what is it we have to do we have to come to see that everything that we consider mortal is just that part of the divine that is in its changing, growing aspects. And but in the mind, remember, in the higher mind is the memory. Memory resides in the mercy part. Therefore, everything we've ever been, we remember. I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. There's only one I am. So what do, what do you want to worry? I mean, why do you have to worry? Only because you're still caught up in the devil. Why remain caught up in the devil? It's not necessary. Only in human beings is there the possibility 
to get out of the inevitable and inexorable pain which is part of the limitation of manifestation and necessary because it is pain that does, does drive us. It, what it drives is to finally bring that intellect of ours to try to analyze what life is all about and what everything is all about. The analytical faculty. But when you become a spiritual aspirant, I have news for you. You don't need, you need oh, those pains like a hole in the head. If you think you need a hole in the head, then you need the pain. You come to the point where you have to start using that mortal mind, that analytical faculty, to work with it. Because it says in this system of training that we call alchemy, the true alchemy, that we attain to the perfect stone of the wise by the work of the sun, that's Tiferous beauty, and the moon, that's Yesed, foundation, that is, the conscious and subconscious mind, with the aid of Mercury, splendor, that is the analytical, intellectual faculty, with the aid of. So when we start bringing our intellectual analytical faculty to bear on trying to find out why we have manyness, using our intellect for analysis instead of tearing down. But when we take this same intellect that has to be used to analyze accurately and instead of that we start analyzing by opening the intellect to influx from the higher mind, by opening it to the influx, say, from the channel of the hanged man that comes down uh, from the upper spheres. That hanged man, incidentally, means not only reversal of consciousness and, you know, mirroring that which is above, but that also has to do with stabilizing. We have to, after analyzing and using our intellectual faculties to try to analyze and comprehend as much as possible, we then learn how to, you might say, freeze the intellect when necessary. Now, please remember that, when necessary. In solving any problem, we take the intellect, we analyze, we work it over, we chew and chew and chew it over till it's come to the limit of our analysis. Once we've done that, then... We're able to hold that mind like a mirror still to receive whatever else it is that the intellect itself can't do because it isn't on its level. Then the inpouring from the higher mind comes and we have our realization, pure goodness, absolute, complete, and pure goodness, untouchable glory of God goodness. And untouchable glory of God, incidentally, is one of the terms given to splendor. So this mortal mind, my darlings, may not be the true us, but it is an untouchable glory of God that we should love, use properly, and out of it we come to see the immortality aspect of ourselves, of the higher mind. We come to love that lower mind, so-called, in everybody. We come to love the fact that it is because every single human being and every living creature has this variation, this difference, that makes this manyness that the divine can reflect itself in and these garbs a fantastic, absolute, miraculous beingness and manyness. Who can get bored? How can you permit yourself to be bored? Haven't you seen? Look. Look with my heart, because it's in your heart. I share this light, this splendor with you, because you have it. Otherwise, how could it be shared? We bring our light out so that you too can recognize it within yourself. It's in all of us. You cannot die. Your mind is not the intellect. You want it to change. Each, you want to use it for why, the reasons it has been built so that we can start appreciating these manynesses. And when we're in the face of anyone who's different, 
Instead of disliking them, say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for black and white and red and brown or whatever in the races. I mean, these terms are so foolish. They're variations of the glorious garments of God. Thank you, God, for all the fantastic myriad languages. Every language carries its subtlety of meaning, which gives God that much more manynesses. It's myriad reflections of that splendor, that glorious splendor. So now you see what the splendor of God begins to be. The immortality of your being is building itself on the house of mirrors, magic mirrors, so all the myriadness of every incarnation you've been can be enjoyed by you as long as you're the enjoyment of everything else and in the final analysis it's God's enjoyment. Never a time you were not and never a time you will not be. Let's shine. <laughs>